Good morning. As we gather today, we're going to continue our series as we look at the theme of restart. When we come to Christ, it's a new beginning. It's a new life that we're able to share together. And in this, we begin to understand what it means to be with Christ. I mean, we all would like a restart. Uh, we messed some things up. We're like, I wish I could just do that over again, a season of life for a moment. But it doesn't work that way. We all have pasts. But Christ doesn't see our past, but He only sees our future with Him. And so we've seen so far that we've been welcomed home. We've been accepted, we've been embraced, we've been acknowledged and adopted as His own. Uh, but today we see what does it mean to have value in Christ? What does it mean to have that worth? Now, culturally we have so many different things that can separate us. Uh, we live in a world and in a time where we look at all these differences and one of the things that we can easily look at, and not to make you hungry, but it's interesting that each culture has its own style of food. I mean, even in America, we have separations. I mean, think about this way. We have Chicago dogs and things like that, and we've got barbecue. You've got Carolina barbecue. You've got Kansas City barbecue. I mean, every style is different, and acknowledging just the different traits and things that are popular in those regions, but also globally as well. You've got Chinese food and Mexican food. I mean, Italian. We have all these different styles that, that resonate with us. And, and we begin to wander. And, and the thing is, though, that your tastes are different than my tastes. And so while you might want sushi, I, I, want, a, I want a bacon cheeseburger, or whatever it is, it's not wrong. But we also have different tastes. We have different things that we desire. And so the same way we live in this world that is here to point out all our differences. And here we seek those things that help point out our differences. But at the same time, a lot of those things that we chase are all things that we hope that someday will tell us we're worth something. That we have value. That we're important. We see in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. So when we get to heaven, we don't lose that identity. We don't lose this essence of who we are. But take note of that harmony, of the sense of purpose that everyone from every nation, from every place, that every difference are able to gather together to worship God. And so while we have so many things that could separate us, so many things that are false in the sense of what they bring to our lives and do they really bring value more than just momentarily delight. But what we find is, together, we're able to bring harmony to the kingdom of God. See, in the business world, something that can destroy a business so quickly is when you bring in someone new and they don't take time to acknowledge what has made you good to begin with. And I think that's what's interesting because it can destroy a culture when people aren't willing to adhere. One of the things that is we focus on at home is we call raising lions, and that's our boys. We want them to be to be biblical leaders and to be the first to inherit the kingdom of God, to help guide others, to grow into these men of God. And so it, it takes work. It, it takes process that we would continue to help mold them and shape them and teach them. But the thing is, though, so often when we're around people, they might say, you're kind of strict on them. See, here's the thing that we've realized. People like the result. That they love to say that they're, they're well behaved, but sometimes they don't like the process. And so, in the same way as we think about this, the idea of living and, and living with correction and guidance and instruction. But here's the thing. We can't expect people to act a certain way publicly if they're not acting that way privately. And that's the step of faith we need, is that consistency. 
See, values what makes us great. Now, sometimes we only want to look at the product or the outcome or the fruit of it. But value is the process in which you receive, are able to retrieve those results. And so for us spiritually, we understand that that's the process that we have of pruning our faith, of taking time to study, and choosing to believe to exercise those principles. John writes in 1 John chapter 2, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed they had none of them ever belonged to us. Some of the things that we can attend services, we can show up, we can take time to be part, but we might not ever choose to belong. They never assimilated to take here to a culture. And so while we've been accepted to the family of God, we've been welcomed home, we've been adopted as kids, are we acting like it? Have we taken part in the role of the family? And I think that's interesting for us to look at here. And it talks about us living out this faith. See, you can come, you can be part of a church, you can come participate. But if you never assimilate to it, if you never adapt or adhere to the teachings, you never cling tight to those, that's the challenge. That we could be here every week, but it doesn't bring change. We never assimilated, we just gathered. So what do we do to assimilate with the church? Well, the first church in Acts 2, they did these four things. And they grew from hundreds of thousands. Let's see how they did it. In Acts 2, starting in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to those who were in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now in verse 42, we see that he lays out those four things that they allow the people to fully assimilate to full-blown Christians, not just to be gatherers or followers, but that they are in, that they are a part of this. And it created this wonderful response. And so the first thing that verse 42 says is, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Now, I understand as a leader of a church, one of the greatest things I have is the opportunity to come before you and to share life with you and to present the gospel to you. But one of the things that is most difficult is that there's only one of me. And there's so many of everyone else. And so it's difficult in the sense that we just all can't be best friends and spend every moment and every day because you have your life and I have my life. And so how do we share life but not allow it to consume her? And I think that's the challenge that we have because many of you have different interests and different hobbies and you want to go do something. And I'm starting to get older where I've got joints popping out and things like that where it's like, I can't do those things that I used to love to do. It's just not my passion anymore because I'm going to fall apart. And so while we can't have every moment of every day together, the one thing I can do is continue to present the gospel to you. To take God's word and explain it. So for many as we share, we see that it's a community that's or what we say even on behind me, it says it's a compassionate community of reproducing Christ's followers. That we would be growing in God's word. That's what we're about. Our goal is that you get it, you receive it, and you live it out. For myself and Trey and Stephanie as we participate in this, we're not the answers. It's the word of God that's the answer to our lives. It's the word of God that is the explanation of the things that we need to do. And so as the early churches, they began to grow. As they began to share this, we see that it says they, they did what? They didn't adhere to the apostles. They didn't become best friends with the apostles, but they adhered to their teaching. By doing this, they developed a strong faith. We see in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. 
See, there's something fascinating about this text. And just so we're all on the same page, I do not have any English skills. I do not have an English degree. I'm not a great writer by any means. I wrote this entire manuscript with one sentence. No joke. My high school writing teacher, uh, Mrs. Frazier, she was awesome. We had a great relationship. I uh, loved the class. We had a great class. Uh, but she told my mom, she's like, he's just a run-on king. Hopefully he does not have a job where he has to write. And here I am. See, I don't know a lot about writing. It just never clicked. But one thing I understand, there's past and present tense. Things that we have done and things that we intend to do. But here in the Greek, we see something else. This is a progressively active tense. That it continues to require more action. Not just you're going to do it, but you're going to do it again and again and again. So, to read that again in Romans 10, 17, it sounds better like this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word of God. You have faith because you keep hearing the Word of God. See, the thing is, though, many don't realize your faith could be used up. One of the greatest things that my dad has taught me, outside of just loving my family to living by faith, the statement he used to say all the time is that you can only spend it once. If you would get birthday memories, like, remember, you can only spend it once. You can look at a lot of different things, but you can't buy all of them. You can only get one of those things. And the thing is, though, sometimes you buy one and then you go back to your wall and you realize, oh, I'm out of money. Oh, yeah, I forgot I bought that over there. The same way spiritually, if you went through one trial and you made it, but you haven't been actively pursuing and hearing the Word of God, the next time one of those seasons comes, you realize, oh, man, I'm, I'm out of faith. And we begin to crumble and fall. See, we all have different battles. We all have different struggles. We're all in different stages and seasons of life. And maybe you just went left a, a trial. Maybe you're just starting a trial. Wherever you are, we have to have faith to make it through. It's by the Word of God is what gets us by and helps us see what God is doing. But if we do not continue to actively fill ourselves by hearing the Word of God, when it's time to face that trial, that uncertainty, you realize, I'm empty got nothing in me. You don't have what you once did. And so the thing is that we all want a better version of ourselves. We all want to be better, but we cannot change without hearing the word of God. You see in James 1, 21, it says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. We have to change the way of thinking. What is powerful is that you and I, we don't have to play the same part. And the thing is, though, as we continue to pursue faith, we have different things that we need to improve on. We have different things that we need to change and help get better. And so that's what's so powerful. But in the same way, our differences can be so negative upon us. Because I look at someone and, and I see their, their success, and I, I just want that. I, I see their their faith, I see their, their accomplishments, and, and I want that. And it, but the thing is, well, it's not my season. And so rather than be happy, I get remorseful, I get bitter, we get upset. And that's the problem that we have. I want that, Lord, but why would he give us what we're so upset about? He's not going to bless us if our attitude is horrible. See, the places that we're often most resentful are the places we need to ask God to bless us the most. To ask God to change the way we think. So if you read James 1 again, Therefore we get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is prevalent, since so humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. It's a change of mind. It's a mindset, of, it's not what I don't have, but God, this is what you bless me with, and I'm going to use this to further and advance your kingdom. And in this season, I'm going to make it. And hopefully my season will come soon. My, my blessing will come upon us. And so it's not talking about going to heaven 
It's talking about your soul. It's talking about your, your attitude, your, your overall well-being, the way that we're able to serve and to love. And so the soul is not part of us that it's born again when we receive Christ. It's our spirit. Our soul is made up of our emotions and, and all those things that we're, we're trying to figure out. Because we have so much going on and, and life's a roller coaster, the ups and downs and the momentums. And, and that's the thing that's so impactful is we need that stabilizing factor. We need that peace that we get from Christ. We come to church to have our soul saved. As David writes in the Psalms, as the Lord restores my soul. My soul needs refreshed. My soul was refreshed because he let things go. And so we have to think thoughts of joy, not despair, not bitterness. But we need to rejoice with those who are around us. The person next to you, they might be celebrating a victory. But all we look at and say, how come it wasn't my victory right now? Why wasn't it my season? That's not what's taking place here. But we have to learn to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And at first, you might not even be into it. Your heart might not be behind it. But you know that's what God's asking you to do. And say, I don't like that they're getting this, but I want to rejoice with them because I'm happy. And eventually, it just becomes a way of our heart. That we just want to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Hate and frustration only bring division, but joy brings unity of the body of Christ. That's value. That we rejoice as God is blessing. It might not be our blessing, it might not be our time, but if God is blessing the kingdom, then we rejoice with those who rejoice. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The next part here, that next thing that the church was doing, they devoted themselves to fellowship. They continued to stay steady in fellowship. Fellowship was powerful because when we are with fellowship, when we reach out and we share life together, when we're part of those encounter life groups and encounter uh, studies, you're, you're sharing life with other people. And you realize that as you're reading God's word and you're examining his word in reference to your life and the things that you're going through, you realize when you're with other people, that you're not the first person to go through this. That someone else, you went through that too, and how'd you do it, and what got you through? See, when we go through it by ourselves, Satan uses that to separate us, and then he continues to conquer and attack us. It makes us weak. We need that community to be part. It's where strength is. We see in 1 Peter chapter 5, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around we're not looking for someone to devour. Resist him, staying firm in faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. That you are not alone, that you're not the only one facing these hardships. The devil attacks us all in the same way, it's just not at the same time. All of us are under attack and different things, just not the same stuff. And so when we fellowship, with others, we're able to gather, we're able to find strength because you made it through that, I can make it through it. Would you walk with me through this? And so in that we stop losing that moment, that we realize that we're not a stranger, that we're not separated from these things. See, the thing is, though, so often in, in times we, we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And the, for the parents who are raising teenagers and preteens right now, you're in that season of life right now where there's a lot of things going on in their own minds. They're trying to figure out life. They're trying to exercise their independence and all of that and trying to figure out their attitudes and hormones and everything. Parents, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Don't give up. Keep pushing them. Help leading them with the love of Christ that you would continue to raise up young men and women who love the Lord. We see that not only did they devote themselves to fellowship, they also devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. They took part in communion. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for whoever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. So that when whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is an unworthy man manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. 
For those who drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if you were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. So what does that mean? As they would gather, they would begin to examine ourselves. Well, it's telling us that we have to do this self-examination, this self-evaluation. We have to inspect ourselves. Lord, is there something in my life that is not aligning, that I need to take care of that's going to cause me harm or others harm or the kingdom harm? And so this is not about whether we're, we're children. This is not saying that we're unworthy. No, we've already been accepted. We've already been brought in. We've been welcomed home. We've already been adopted as, as hairs of the throne of God. He says, it's not that. It's not that I don't want you. It's not, that's not even the question. But he says, it's because you were mine. I want you to examine and understand this is what I need to change my life in order to follow you more closely. He wants us to step in and to begin to remove things so he doesn't have to. And so in that, we ask that we would just examine. It's, it's not the, that I might have judged whether I'm saved or not, but it's asking, am I doing everything right? And so as his kids, God wants us to see our faults. He gives us the power to discipline ourselves. I want you to correct yourself. God is not a big, angry God. God is saying, I want to ask yourself these questions. Where am I messing up? Where am I hurting others? Am I hurting myself? He's giving this as an opportunity to deal with it. The first church was doing that. Lord, I'm sorry I had a bad attitude. I'm sorry for what I did. I'm going to fix it. They were constantly getting better because they had a culture of self-correction. And then finally we see the fourth one in Acts chapter 2. They devote themselves of prayer. There's many things and seasons as you go through that God won't answer you in just a matter of minutes. It's hours of meditation and prayer, waiting for God's answer and direction. Other times are just simple prayers that you can give up in a minute or two and be like, I'm good to go. I know the direction. But when things pop up, we need to have an attitude of prayer that Little things, big things, any time in your day. Lord, thank you for that blessing. Lord, help me get through this. Give me a better attitude. Continue to strengthen me. That type of prayer. The prayer that guides us and gives us direction. Gives us wisdom, discernment of how to make decisions. It wasn't that they were praying these long prayers. It wasn't that they had just prayed without ceasing. But they were, rather they were constantly giving it up to the God. Constantly giving up what was rightfully His. Trusting Him, that Lord, that you would help us live our lives. And so when we devote ourselves to prayer, when we devote ourselves to this kind of lifestyle, we're able to feel that peace, to feel that God was there. We might not be able to explain, but when people see us, when people are around you, they're like, something is different, and I don't even know what it is, but I'm, I know it's God's presence with Him, that God is amongst them, that there's a peace like none other. And that would be the life and example that we set. That that's the value that we have in unity with Christ. That we would have all these things that could divide and separate us, but we choose to unite under those things. That we're able to turn to assimilate with the culture that God has. That we've been brought in, we've been welcomed, accepted, adopted, and assimilated. That, that we are now part of this, willing to actively hear God's word and fill ourselves up with this. Hear the teachings, gather to me and breaking of bread, and to be in prayer. That's how the church was able to define the value. Because they were a constant work of progress. And that value of Jesus Christ. They weren't just churchgoers. They were Christians. And that's the challenge that we have. Is that we will continue to grow in this faith. It's not a question, are we saved? Here it tells us we've been brought in. But now it's time that we live it out. I will lift you high